Hi, Laura. Yeah, hi. Hi, Luca. So I think we have to wait a few minutes uh, because it seems that most people are not there. Uh, the speaker is ready. Uh, whenever you want it, we can start. Actually, we typically start on time. Okay. Yeah, okay. I see. Yeah, now. How can you? Hi. Hi. Should I share my screen? Yes, I think that's a good, good idea. So in the meantime, welcome to the second session in the afternoon. And um, yeah, so I will be chairing this second part. And please, I remind you to keep your video on if possible, especially when discussing and asking questions, but also generically. If I may say something, also for another reason, we may try to get a collage uh, for the photo group photo. So if we take snapshots and then we combine, maybe we can manage without doing a special session tomorrow. So if you please let your videos open, we try to get these images for a moment. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. That's a good idea. Otherwise, we could try to do a, a how you call it, huge number of uh, connection at the same time. But uh, it's in some cases difficult to match it and to fit it in the screen. Okay. Okay, so I think we are ready to go. So um, let's uh, um, welcome the first speaker, Kalia Petraki, who will tell us about uh, dark matter bound state. Thank you very much. Uh, you do see my slides, right? My screen? Yes, we see okay. your slides. Everything seems to work fine. Okay, thank you very much. So I will talk about uh, dark matter bound states and their effect uh, on the production of dark matter in the early universe. Uh, so I thought that uh, I should explain why first uh, state the obvious, why we care about the production of dark matter in the early universe. Um, we care because it depends on the couplings of dark matter to other particles. And this is how we hope to detect dark matter. So by studying the production, we can get an idea of what these couplings should be. And then, uh, of course, uh, deduce the experimental signatures uh, from that calculation. Um, so the most uh, well studied and uh, perhaps uh, the most generic or one of the most generic production mechanisms of uh, dark matter is the so-called thermal freeze out, which is well known. So just very quickly, the idea is that uh, dark matter was in uh, chemical and kinetic equilibrium in the early universe with the primordial plasma via very fast uh, pair creation and annihilation processes. Uh, at some point, the temperature dropped, dark matter became non-relativistic, the density became exponentially suppressed, uh, the dark matter particles could not find each other anymore, self-destruction stopped, and this is when the dark matter density froze out. So this simple calculation, as is well known, gives the correct, uh, the observed uh, dark matter relic density if the annihilation cross-section uh, times relative velocity is of the order of one picobar. And because this is the cross-section of the weak interactions, this was deemed to be uh, the WIMP miracle. Um, now, uh, this is a production mechanism that can be implemented by, very, uh, via, uh, by various uh, particle physics models. One, uh, class of models is indeed uh, WIP models, that is particles coupled to the weak interactions of the standard model, such as the lightest supersymmetric particle in supersymmetric models. But it's also possible that uh, dark matter couples to the standard model of particles via other yet unknown uh, non-standard model interactions that we often parameterize via uh, effective operators. Or is it, it is also possible that uh, dark matter couples uh, primarily and annihilates mostly into um, a set of light uh, degrees of freedom, non-standard model degrees of freedom, so a dark sector of particles. And uh, this dark sector may have some very feeble couplings uh, to the standard model. An example of that is dark matter coupled to a dark photon that uh, mixes kinetically with hypercharge. All in all, uh, this uh, picture of uh, thermal freeze out, and especially the two first implementations, particle physics implementations of thermal freeze out, have given rise to the pillars of uh, what has been the pillars of dark matter uh, research in the past uh, decades, where um, the couplings that are responsible for the production of dark matter in the early universe uh, are also responsible for uh, the signatures that we expect to detect for dark matter in uh, our uh, in colliders, in direct detection experiments, and uh, in indirect searches. 
So, so far, of course, we have not uh, detected anything. And so the question is, where do we go? So there are two uh, broad directions where we can go. One is uh, we can examine, uh, we can consider heavier dark matter than what we already have, uh, that is less constrained or it's not constrained by uh, by current experimental, uh, by, by experiments currently, or lighter dark matter. On the front of lighter dark matter, there is, um, there is a whole host of uh, new direct detection experiments that uh, have been or are being developed, and I think the previous talk was about that. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the possibility of heavier dark matter, and by heavier dark matter, I mean multi-TV dark matter. Now, why may we care about uh, multi-TV dark matter? Well, if we stick with the good old uh, WIMPs, in fact, uh, some of the simplest uh, thermorelic WIMP models live in the multi-TV scale. If we calculate the thermal density, um, the, the relic density produced uh, by a thermal freeze out, what we find is that we get the uh, observed uh, abundance if uh, the dark matter mass is of the order of a few TV. This is, for example, the case with uh, win or like dark matter, so a triplet under SU2. Uh, and in fact, if we care more broadly about thermorelic dark matter, be it WIMPs or something else, uh, then thermorelic dark matter can be as heavy as a few hundred TV. And this is, in fact, a good question. How heavy can thermorelic dark matter be? And how do the dark matter interactions, the dark matter dynamics manifest uh, in this mass regime when we talk about multi-TV uh, dark matter up to uh, whatever is the largest mass that thermorelic dark matter can have. So if dark matter is very heavy, then uh, what happens uh, quite likely is that uh, two important length scales, one is the De Broglie wavelength uh, and the other one is uh, the so-called Bohr momentum, both of them of course inversely proportional to the dark matter mass. So the De Broglie wavelength and the Bohr uh, radius, uh, so alpha here stands for some coupling of dark matter to some force mediator and uh, of course it is well specified within specific theories. So it happens that uh, these uh, length scales are smaller than the interaction range which is the uh, inverse mediator mass. Not necessarily because the mediator is light but rather because dark matter is heavy. Uh, so the mediator can still be the they can be still be the electroweak uh, the weak gauge bosons so they can be quite heavy but if dark matter is even heavier then the interactions mediated by these uh, particles uh, will manifest as long range. Now does this really happen in uh, interesting in well motivated dark matter scenarios? Yes, it does. Uh, the interactions of dark matter manifest as long range in a variety of dark matter models. Uh, this includes what was used to be called exotic models, such as self-interacting dark matter, or models that have been invoked uh, at times to explain the occasional uh, astrophysical anomaly. But in fact, long range interactions are relevant also for uh, WIMP dark matter, uh, both to begin with for WIMP dark matter that is heavier than a few TV, because uh, even the weak interactions of the standard model that have been the prototype of contact interactions in particle physics, even the weak interactions manifest as long range if dark matter is heavier than a few TV, exactly because of the relation I wrote up here. And in fact, uh, the long range uh, nature or long range effects uh, are important also in wind dark matter scenarios in the sub TV regime. Uh, but in scenarios where dark matter co-annihilates with uh, uh, particles that uh, carry either electric charge or uh, color. Uh, because in this case, uh, those mediators, of course, the gluons and the photons are masses. Um, so now, what, are, uh, what happens if the interactions manifest uh, as long range? Well, there are broadly two kinds of things uh, that happen. The first one is something that has been studied quite uh, widely in uh, uh, the, uh, the literature in the past. It's the so-called Sommerfeld effect. The Sommerfeld effect is the fact that a long range interaction distorts the wave function of a pair of particles, a pair of dark matter particles here that interacts. And because of this distortion of the wave function, um, this affects all the cross sections. 
this includes the annihilation cross sections and of course also elastic scattering and ev everything we can imagine. Um, but if the annihilation cross sections change as a result of the Sommerfeld effect, this means that uh, the dark matter production in the early universe via freeze out is affected. So the Sommerfeld effect changes the correlation of parameters that produce the observed dark matter density, and also the indirect detections are affected, both directly and indirectly. They're affected because of uh, freeze out, so because of the correlation, because the correlation of parameters has changed, uh, and also um, so the Sommerfeld effect uh, directly has an impact on uh, the annihilation processes that uh, give the indirect detection signals. Okay, so, but then another thing uh, that happens is the fact that long range interactions generically imply the existence of bound levels. Uh, there are many different kinds of bound states. Uh, I have, I have uh, dis distinguished here two um, different uh, broad categories, unstable bound states and stable bound states. Unstable bound states are typically particle and the particle bound states, so positronium-like bound states, although it can be more complicated. You can have two different uh, species that form a bound state and uh, they can still uh, co-annihilate. And so if unstable bound states form, then uh, they decay into radiation. And this means that they essentially offer an extra annihilation channel for dark matter. And as such, this affects uh, freeze out, indirect detection. And in fact, it gives rise to a novel indirect detection signal because bound state formation happens always with dissipation of energy. Uh, we have bound state formation is the transition from a higher energy state to free particles that have kinetic energy into a, a, a bound state that um, has a, a, a lower energy. So energy has to be dissipated. This happens radiatively, and this can give rise to a novel type of indirect detection signals. Uh, and then uh, there is the ability of uh, stable bound states. This is particularly uh, relevant to a models of asymmetric dark matter, much like it is particularly relevant to ordinary matter, which is asymmetric. Uh, and this has a whole, a whole host of uh, very dramatic uh, consequences that I will not talk about. So the only thing I will talk about here is actually the most subtle of all implications of bound states, uh, which is their effect on freeze out. And even that is actually quite dramatic. So, um, uh, so I will. Uh, there are four things that I want to go through uh, briefly, of course. Uh, first, uh, I will start with a very simple dark U1 sector, just to show what happens. Then I will discuss very briefly the uh, relation between the unitarity limit and long-range interactions. Then some results from neutralino or four neutralino score annihilation scenarios, and then uh, the Higgs doublet as a light force uh, mediator, which is. Uh, probably uh, quite new. Okay, dark U1 sector. Let's uh, assume that dark matter is made of uh, uh, a pair of uh, Dirac uh, fermions that couple to a dark photon that we will assume here to be massless or extremely light. Uh, then, uh, as we know, there is a, the dominant annihilation process is uh, a pair of uh, a particle and the particle uh, uh, pair uh, annihilating into two dark photons. But besides this process, uh, what the other thing that can happen is that uh, a particle and a particle pair can form in, can uh, be captured into a bound state, so a positronium-like bound state with emission of a dark photon. And then uh, this bound state decays into two or three photons in this model, depending on what spin it has. So in the plot here, you can see the uh, cross sections for these two processes, the direct annihilation into two dark photons and bound state formation by emission of a dark photon, normalized to the three level, uh, uh, to so-called perturbative um, uh, uh, cross section for the, for the direct annihilation. And so um, what happens here is that uh, at large velocities, the annihilation cross-section is uh, the three-level diagram. So this part of the diagram that you see here, because uh, of the long-range interaction, uh, the, uh, which the particle and the particle pair exchanges dark photons uh, at infinity, and this distorts the wave function. So this is uh, represented by this part of the diagram over here. Um, 
And because the interaction here is attractive, uh, this means that the annihilation cross-section is enhanced, and it's enhanced by this factor that is plotted uh, on this uh, plot. And the horizontal axis is alpha over v. So at low velocities, also at large couplings, um, the annihilation cross-section is larger than what we would have expected from a three-level calculation, which uh, neglects the Sommerfeld effect. Okay, what about uh, bound state formation? Bound state formation is the red line. And what you see is that at large velocities, bound state formation is very suppressed, which is normal because particles are very energetic. They don't get captured into bound states. But at low velocities, bound state formation actually becomes the dominant inelastic process. And for this particular model, uh, the two cross sections are actually proportional. Uh, at this regime, uh, where alpha over v is larger than 1, and they're proportional to, af to alpha over v. Um, and there is a factor of th about 3 uh, difference. Okay, so if bound state formation is the dominant inelastic process, and since bound states uh, decay uh, and uh, deplete the dark matter density in this way, then we should better do the freeze-out calculation again. And so here is the result. Uh, the freeze out calculation gives the correlation between the coupling of the theory, alpha, so the dark gauge coupling, and the dark matter mass. Uh, and you see the three different determinations when we consider perturbative annihilation only, Sommerfeld enhanced annihilation, and uh, Sommerfeld enhanced annihilation plus bound state formation. Again, the reason this is important is because this correlation of parameters is what determines the experimental signatures. Now, what we observe here is that uh, the long-range effects, Sommerfeld and bound states, start uh, affecting uh, the dark matter density and therefore the, this correlation of parameters at a uh, mass of a few TV. And the other thing that we see here is something that I have uh, denoted on the right side of the plot, uh, so something about uh, the uh, unitarity limit. So let me uh, go to the unitarity limit and explain this. So, um, so the unitarity of the S matrix, which, uh, uh, which essentially corresponds to uh, conservation of uh, probability, implies that uh, there is an upper limit on the partial wave in elastic cross-section. This is the upper limit. So L is the partial wave, and this is uh, the upper limit on the inelastic cross-section. Uh, as you can see, this limit, of course, does not contain any coupling. Uh, the coupling is uh, large enough such that the uh, probability for inelastic scattering has saturated to one. This is the meaning of this unitarity limit on the inelastic cross-section. The only thing that the unitarity limit contains are kinematic variables, the mass and the velocity. And of course, it depends also on the partial wave. So back in the 90s, Grist and Kamionkowski, in a seminal paper, they pointed out that this upper limit on the inelastic cross-section, which of course includes the annihilation cross-section, uh, implies an upper limit on the mass of thermoelectric matter. They found this by saying that, well, the cross-section we need for thermoelectric dark matter, which this is the today's determination of this cross-section, the canonical value, has to respect the unitarity limit. And from this, we did use an upper limit on the dark matter mass, which is of the order of 100 TV. The way they did this calculation assumes contact type interactions. In particular, they assumed that sigma times V is constant, does not depend on the velocity. And they also argued that only the S wave uh, contribution is important and higher partial waves give sub subdominant contributions. However, if we look carefully at the parametric dependence of the unitarity limit on the cross-section, uh, we see that the parametric dependence, this, this cross-section, this sigma v scales as 1 over v and scales as 1 over m squared, this parametric dependence cannot be realized by contact type interactions, which typically give sigma v constant or something proportional to some positive power of v uh, in a non-relativistic expansion. Uh, the unitarity limit scales as 1 over v, and this implies that actually it can be realized so it can be approached or attained only if the interactions of the theory manifest as long range. Now, long range interactions imply the existence of bound states, as we, as we saw. Bound states can form via higher partial waves than those which give rise to annihilation. And all of this means that uh, the upper limit on the mass of thermorelic dark matter may actually be much higher than previously anticipated. But more importantly than the actual upper limit on the dark matter mass, which may be not 100 TV, but 300 or uh, 500 TV, 
it has been calculated, of course. Uh, more importantly than that, we conclude that uh, the interactions of dark matter in viable thermal relic scenarios close to the unitarity limit, that is close to 100 TV, manifest as long range. Otherwise, the dark matter scenario is not, is not viable in terms of producing the relic abundance by a thermal freeze out. Um, and so if this behavior is expected at 100 TV, then it will, by continuity, manifest also at the few, at the lower mass, uh, probably a few tens of TV or few TV. Exactly where depends on the model. Many models, um, explicit calculations in many models uh, show that it manifests at around a few TV, as we saw before in the U1 case. So the more detailed argumentation for this connection between unitarity limit and uh, long range interactions, you can find it in this paper over here. Okay, so let me go back to freeze out and see uh, and go through some other uh, examples. So neutralino uh, score coannihilation scenarios in supersymmetric models. They are one of the last refuges of uh, uh, neutralino dark matter in SUSY, the reason being that uh, uh, in these scenarios uh, we, there is a degenerate spectrum, so the mass of the neutralino, the lightest supersymmetric particle, and uh, the squark, the lightest squark, uh, they are very close. And this means uh, that uh, uh, the jets produced at uh, the LHC are, are soft, and this helps evade the LHC constraints. These scenarios also tend to have a large uh, coupling of the, light of the stop to the Higgs, uh, which uh, uh, does two things. It actually produces this degenerate spectrum, and it also reproduces the measured Higgs uh, mass. So this is why these uh, scenarios are interesting. Now, if, uh, however, the neutralino mass is very close to the lightest uh, squark mass, uh, then what happens is that the two co-annihilate. And to determine the dark matter relic density in the real universe, we have to take into account not only the uh, uh, neutralino self-annihilation processes, but also the uh, squark self-annihilation processes and the various co-annihilation processes. The squark is a um, colored particle, and this means that we have to take into account uh, all of the QCD uh, re related uh, effects. So if we do that, so here, if we write a toy model where we have dark matter, the lightest squark, and assume that the two are in chemical equilibrium in the real universe, then we can calculate the annihilation and bound state formation uh, cross sections for the squark and just neglect all other processes. Here is the annihilation and here is bound state formation again as a function of alpha over V. And you see that bound state formation can exceed annihilation uh, even by more than an order of magnitude. And just uh, a reminder here, so the strong coupling is of the order of point, point 0.1 for this uh, case, because we're talking about TV scale masses and QCD is still perturbative. So then if we redo the freeze out calculation, we can determine the two free parameters here is the mass difference between the neutralino and the squark and the dark matter mass. And you see how including bound states affects the determination of the correlation between two these two parameters. The reason this is important is because, first of all, we see that dark matter can be heavier than previously anticipated, and this is important for indirect detection. And the other thing we see is that the mass gap between the two particles can be larger than previously predicted. And this is important for colliders because it actually makes this uh, class of models more detectable, potentially. And the last thing I want to mention is the Higgs doublet as a, a light uh, mediator. So um, the Higgs uh, is, of course, uh, quite heavy, heavier than all other standard model uh, bosons. Uh, nevertheless, if we're talking about dark matter in the multi-TV regime, the Higgs can manifest as a light mediator. And this means that uh, it can uh, participate in the Sommerfeld effect and it can participate in the binding of bound states and as such it can affect freeze out. Now besides these two effects, there is yet another effect which is uh, even more dramatic and very interesting. The formation of bound states, unstable bound states in this case, uh, via emission of a Higgs. Now it has been calculated and is well known that uh, the that bound state formation by emission of a neutral scalar is a quadruple process, a quadruple transition uh, for a particle and a particle pair. So it is very suppressed and is usually irrelevant. However, if the scalar that is emitted has some kind of charge, abelian, non-abelian, global or local, 
Uh, then what happens is that the potential between the two interacting particles, between the initial and the final state changes, the effective Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian changes, and this precipitates a, an extremely fast uh, transition, um, that, uh, and which is actually a monopole transition. And it's extremely, extremely fast, even for fairly small couplings. Now, we obviously have a charged scalar uh, that exists in nature, that is the Higgs doublet. And also, we can think about it in terms of uh, Goldstone modes in the broken electroweak phase. So to see the effect of uh, this process and also of the Higgs mediated potential, we considered here the simplest uh, model of a singlet, uh, singlet doublet uh, fermionic uh, multiplets that co-annihilate. Uh, they mix below the electroweak phase transition. The lightest component is dark matter. Now, if so this, uh, the singlet and the doublet couple also to the Higgs via a Yukawa coupling. And uh, if they are heavier than about 5 TV, then freeze out begins before the electroweak phase transition. So we can actually do the calculation in the unbroken electroweak phase. So in this simple model, which is really the simplest one, there are already, there is a lot of complication. There are various uh, species, different species of bound states that uh, you see over here. And uh, what I want you to note here is that uh, the bound state formation cross-sections can be by orders of magnitudes larger than the annihilation cross-section. And this means that there will be an effect on the dark matter relic density and therefore on the uh, correlation between the couplings of the theory here, the only coupling we have is the coupling to the Higgs uh, versus uh, the dark matter mass. And so the cyan line here uh, is what we get if we take into account the formation of uh, bound states via Higgs emission and the Higgs mediated uh, potential. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the effect on uh, the relic uh, density, this is an effect that goes up to two orders of magnitude, so it is rather dramatic. And uh, this is the simplest model, uh, where for various reasons the effect is not uh, maximal. If we consider uh, models with higher multiplets, electroweak multiplets, we expect that the effect will actually be even larger and relevant to a larger parameter uh, space. So I will close by saying that uh, uh, bound states uh, really necessitate and imply that we should uh, con reconsider thermal decoupling, dark matter thermal decoupling at the uh, multi-TV scale. There is a very interesting connection that makes this statement even more robust between the unitarity limit and uh, long-range interactions. And there is a number of uh, experimental uh, implications uh, for which, uh, because of which uh, doing this calculation uh, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, are there questions? Uh, yes, let's uh, clap hands. Of course, uh, I can do it uh, physically, otherwise uh, virtually. Okay, at the moment I don't see any questions. So I, I have one um, actually regarding this uh, last point on the Higgs. So so in this case, uh, the, the states you're considering to be bounded, uh, are they bounded through the electroweak force or through this Yukawa uh, potential? Uh, both, so it depends. So there is a, there are many different pairs of uh, particles that uh, we need to consider here. We need to, so uh, yes, so both of them participate in general uh, in, uh, in the potential. And nevertheless, uh, the, um, the, you mean the Higgs exchange is, is stronger than the electroweak uh, exchange? Uh, in this model, it happens and in the parameter space that is relevant, yes. Uh, but this is not necessarily, so I think if you consider higher multiplets, I mean, here, if you, like we have actually considered a singlet, so there is no, the singlet doesn't have uh, yeah, gates couplings. If you, if we were to consider, say, a double triplet model, I think the gates couplings would have a much bigger effect and uh, they will make the binding energy of the bound states um, larger. And this means that uh, actually the effect would be more important because the deeper the bound states are, the more, uh, the, the stronger the effect is. Okay, thank you. So I see another question. So Pilar, uh, please ask. Hello, thanks for the nice talk. I am curious about uh, the uncertainties in these estimations of uh, cross-sections. I mean, is there 
Um, I mean, it's this well known, and uh, but it looks rather complex to deal with uh, bound states. So, what's the status of this? I mean, is this um, something you can rely on being aligned, or there is some uncertainties that maybe require some non perturbative uh, methods? So, it is non perturbative because, uh, but it is what we call perturbative, non-perturbative, right? So we, st we always stay uh, in the regime that the coupling is perturbative. Uh, the effect is non-perturbative. When we resum the, the, the boson, the gauge boson exchange or the Higgs exchange, that's non-perturbative. We do it at leading order. So the potential is calculated at leading order. So the Coulomb or the Gava potential is the leading order approximation, the one boson exchange. Uh, and this is indeed one of the approximations. There are many other leading order approximations and it is true that uh, I mean one could try to go to higher orders uh, that would be very complicated at this stage because we haven't even completely finished with the leading order like there are you know for example the Higgs emission is, is a new effect that uh, so at this point uh, I think this is this satisfactory um, well but uh, of course, corrections are welcome. Thank you. I don't know if that's uh, the answer, but... Uh... Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, other questions? Last chance? Okay, I don't see any. So let's thanks uh, Kalia again for the very nice talk. And of course, the discussion can continue on, uh, on Slack, um, so... In that sense, you can still ask question there. So now we proceed to the uh, PhD forum. So we will uh, move uh, to the talks. I uh, recall that the talks are uh, four minutes plus one and one question. And the first speaker, uh, Giacomo Landini, will tell us about uh, accidental dark matter models. Are you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. It's not full screen, but we can see it. Yeah, now maybe it's full screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Giacomo Landini, and I am a PhD student from the University of Pisa. And today I will briefly discuss my work on uh, accidental dark matter models. So we know from astrophysical and cosmological data that about uh, one fourth of our universe is composed by dark matter. And we know what are dark matter main properties. So it must be a neutral particle, stable, or at least very long lived, cold, and weakly interacting with the standard model particles. And we know that to satisfy all these requirements, we need some new physics beyond the standard model. Uh, but uh, let's go back to the standard model for a while and let's consider the proton. And we know that this particle is stable, or at least its lifetime is very, 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 very. Uh, why? Well, this is just uh, the consequence of an accidental bio number symmetry of the standard model Lagrangian uh, up to a normalizable level, which in turn is a consequence of gauge invariance. Uh, therefore, the proton being the lightest pion is automatically stable. Uh, of course, it could decay by means of higher, higher dimensional operators, which break uh, by a number, but since these operators are suppressed by the cutoff scale of a theory, the effect is tiny. So the natural question you can ask is, uh, can the matter be accidentally stable as the proton? And in general, the answer is yes. What we need is, first of all, a dark sector. Uh, we can think of as a confining or spontaneously broken dark gauge theory. And gauge invariance naturally leads to a set of accidental global symmetries of the action, at least up to a certain dimension. We can have uh, U1 numbers or so some discrete digital symmetries and so on. And so uh, the lightest state with non-trivial transformation properties is therefore uh, automatically stable and can be identified with the dark matter candidate of the model. Of course, uh, if we take into account uh, higher dimensional operators, this can break the accidental symmetries of some dimension so that uh, dark matter can decay. But uh, if the dimension of these operators is large enough, then the dark matter lifetime can still be very, very long. So that's the general framework. And I will show two examples. The first one is the gravitational vector dark matter. Here we study in a pure strain gauge theory with only dark gauge vectors and coupled to gravity. And we found out that this uh, model is accidentally invariant, uh, at least up to dimension n operators, under Z2 group parity, which we call O parity, which is nothing but a, a reflection in group space. 
and here I show the explicit, explicit action of the gauge vectors. Uh, then the theory confines some scale lambda, and after confinement, the only acceptable uh, asymptotic states are gauge invariant bound states made of uh, dark vectors, which we generically call globals. And among all different kinds of globals, there are some special ones which are odd under this opality, and the four can decay only through dimensional operators. And since these operators are at the large dimension, this particle are very long lived, even if uh, very massive, with masses up to 10 to the 14 GB. Uh, so they can be dark matter, provided that they are produced via the so called uh, gravitational physics mechanism. Uh, here I show the parameter space in which, in the allowed regions, we can see that dark matter can either be a mildly heavy particle at a wind scale or a very heavy particle. At the second example, we study uh, SUN gauge group with a scalar field in the symmetric representation, plus uh, a set of heavy fermions which are charged under both SUN and uh, the standard model gauge group. And this framework provides uh, an accidental pre shaping symmetry, which is also automatically preserved by higher order operators of two dimension n. So it can solve the strong speed problem uh, together with the so called uh, pre quality problem. And then the pre-shaping symmetry together with SON get broken by the scalar verb to SON. And this gives rise to an axiom field in the spectrum. And we also find that the model is invariant and an accidental is actually opality, which is nothing but the generalization of the opality symmetry I discussed previously. And most importantly, the symmetry is preserved by the unbroken s dynamics. So the model predicts accidental multi-component dark matter, we have axioms, to the vacuum alignment mechanism plus a Z2 outbound state, we can be produced thermally. Uh, so, finally, to conclude, uh, we saw that a dark confining of spontaneously broken gauge sector gives rise to a set of accidental global symmetries, which in turn naturally lead to automatically stable or at least very long lived dark matter candidates. And finally, I want to point out that gauge dynamics is also interesting by itself because it allows us to address several theoretical issues, such as the check green quality, phase transition dynamics, or also dualities among the different phases, and so on. Uh, you can find more details on it in my poster, and I thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll begin clapping. Is there a, a question? OK, I don't see any. So oh, wait. Wait. there is one. That is, that is Michele. Let's let Michele out. Ask his question. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. So, just wondering whether the Pichiquin symmetry you're mentioning in the axion, I mean, are you referring to a QCD axion or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's related because we introduced some heavy fermions and some of them are colored on the QCD, so they can provide the correct uh, QCD anomalies. In fact, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, for further question, again, there is the Slack channel. Thank you. So we can move to the next speaker, uh, Catherine Fraser. So, yes, good. I see already the slides. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Perfect. you. Uh, all right. Uh, so my name is Katie. I am a graduate student at Harvard, and the title of my talk is Constraints on CP Violating Higgs Portal Mayor on a Dark Matter. It's based on work put out last fall uh, with former Harvard grad student uh, Linda Shu and current student Aditya Preek, who I should also mention has a poster on a different project at this conference. Um, so as you all know, dark matter is very well motivated um, and there are many complex models to try to explain its fundamental interactions. But rather than introduce another model here, I really wanna take a step back and ask whether the simplest models of dark matter are really ruled out. So in particular, if dark matter is a Majorana fermion uh, that talks to the standard model uh, through the Higgs portal, is with dark matter still a viable candidate? Um, and I'm gonna argue that the answer is yes, as long as it has a CP violating coupling. Uh, so what do we exactly need in order to have a viable dark matter candidate? Uh, well, we need two things. First, we need a large annihilation signal. So we need a signal kind of order one to 10 picobarns uh, to get the correct thermal relic abundance for annihilation. Um, and coincidentally, this is the same order of magnitude cross section that's required uh, if the galactic center access is explained by dark matter. Um, I should point out that the galactic center access in particular also provides additional uh, motivation for the Higgs portal uh, because it's well fit by dark matter annihilating through the Higgs to BB bar. 
Uh, the second thing we need is a small direct detection cross section. So as you can see from the slightly outdated plot on the right, uh, direct detection constraints are becoming increasingly stringent. Now they're at something like order 10 to the minus 10 picobarns. Uh, so the challenge is really to reconcile this large annihilation cross section with a small direct detection cross section. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, well, the typical solution relies on an ash channel resonance, what I have on the left. So we take the dark matter mass to be half the Higgs mass, and that enhances annihilation without changing scattering. But the problem with this is that for two Majorana fermions, annihilation is still P wave suppressed real couplings. And the reason for this is that two Majorana fermions form a CP odd state because they're identical. The CP even state would vanish identically, but the Higgs is CP even. So instead, the mechanism I want to focus on in this talk is CP violation. This has the advantage that it avoids velocity suppression. So because the Majorana fermions and the Higgs have different CP properties, annihilation is going to be proportional to the imaginary part of the Higgs coupling. Whereas on the other hand, direct detection is still controlled by the real part of the Higgs coupling because the initial and final states and scattering have the same CP. And what that means is this mechanism really gives me two independent levers, the mass of the dark matter and the phase of the Higgs coupling, to be able to tune to change the relative size of annihilation and direct detection. I should point out that this was previously mentioned in a paper by Karina et al., uh, but our paper really explores it much more generally than the SUSE scenario that they talk about. Uh, so to be concrete, dark matter is a mayor on a fermion chi that couples to the Higgs and also has an axial coupling to the Z. Uh, and in addition to annihilation and spin-independent direct detection, which I just mentioned, uh, there also are spin-dependent direct detection constraints, but these are pretty easy to avoid just by making the Z coupling small enough. Uh, so I really want to focus on these first two constraints from annihilation and spin independent direct detection. And in particular, the point that I want to emphasize is that whether we need to tune the mass or the phase really depends on the size of the coupling. Uh, so here I have the small coupling case on the left and the large coupling case on the right. Each of these plots, the shading shows the ratio of the annihilation cross section to the spin independent cross section as a function of the dark matter mass on the X axis and the phase of the Higgs coupling on the Y axis. And you can see uh, the scales of the two plots are a little bit different. So I've zoomed in on the phase on the right, but zoomed out on the mass. Uh, the region allowed by direct detection is between these two solid lines labeled xenon 1t. And the region allowed by annihilation on the left is inside this annulus between the two ellipses labeled 1 picobarn and 10 picobarn. And on the right is inside these two strips, which are actually part of an annulus that you just can't see the ends of. Uh, and so what I really want to emphasize is that on the left, we have this very narrow ellipse. So in the small coupling case, we have a standard scenario where we really need to tune the mass to increase annihilation, but we have flexibility with direct detection. In contrast, on the right, when we have large coupling, we have a different way to get a viable signal, uh, where basically we can easily get the right annihilation signal because we have a large coupling, but we really need to tune the phase to suppress direct detection. But of course, this isn't the whole story. Um, and in particular, uh, there are other constraints that are sensitive to high mass physics, things like the electron EVM because we have CP violation, electroweak corrections because we have a new doublet and collider constraints. And so we really need to analyze this in the context of UV completion. Uh, and so in particular, we find in this very minimal UV completion, a singlet doublet model uh, that has a Dirac doublet, Psi2, a mayor on a singlet, Psi1, and Yukawa couplings to the standard model Higgs, that there actually is viable parameter space. And we see a very similar story in the UV to the IR. Uh, so basically we have the small coupling, again, we have the small coupling case on the left and a large coupling case on the right. Um, and we still have these two scenarios where uh, you can tune the mass in the small coupling case or the phase in the right. So I really wanna leave you with the idea that uh, CP violation is a viable alternative uh, to uh, mass resonance and that it can be probed by upcoming experiments. So stay tuned for results from those. Thank you. Thank you, thanks a lot. Again, time for just one question. Okay, I don't see it any. So, okay, Jörg, I see that Jörg is also high, having a hand up. Um, yeah, so what's the, the best signal, so to speak, for um, the final results? So, if, so what channel would you best um, find this model? Um. So, I mean, the two places where you're most likely to see deviations really are direct detection and electron EDM, depending on whether the coupling is real, mostly real or mostly imaginary. Um, so those are kind of the two strongest constraints that you have and the strongest places you'd see a deviation. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, 
then uh, yeah, further discussion on Slack again, and we can uh, move to the third speaker. Sonali Verna. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Ah, you are here. Okay, I see you. Yep. So please share One your second. screen. Can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, we also okay. see Okay, great. Uh, let me once check the slider. Okay, everything seems to be working, I think. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. And um, thanks a lot for organizing this lovely workshop and having me here. So uh, let me begin. So uh, I'd like to talk about uh, a model independent framework for probing elusive dark sectors at future experiments. This is an ongoing work that I'm doing with my collaborators here, Misha and Costa. So uh, yeah, I begin. Yep. So it could be uh, that a dark sector exists which contains dark matter. Now, this dark sector could be neutral under the standard model. However, it could be coupled with the standard model via such a portal interaction. Now, a portal interaction, uh, like I've written here, can be written as a product of a dark sector singlet operator and a standard model singlet operator. Now, uh, today I'll be talking about the scenario in which such portals have dimensions greater than four, or they are irrelevant. Now, in this case, uh, the coupling between the dark sector and the standard model is highly suppressed uh, with respect to relevant portals, and hence they are more elusive. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I said that I'm going to describe a model independent framework. So in order to do this, uh, we have uh, some minimal assumptions. Now, uh, we characterize the dark dynamics using two energy scales, and this is just for simplicity. So we have the lambda UV scale where the mediator is exchanged and we have the lambda IR, which is the mass of the lightest state in the theory. Now we assume a large hierarchy between the two scales and uh, at energies E such that E is far away from the two scales, the theory is going to be approximately conformal. Now we use this to calculate rates and cross sections in a model independent way. So how do we do that? Now, when we're in this regime where S is the squared momentum of the dark sector, we can leave out the contributions coming from close to the threshold and consider only the conformal contributions uh, while computing the dark sector produ uh, production cross section. So moreover, uh, we can use uh, this optical theorem and write this matrix element integrating over the dark sector phase space in terms of the imaginary part of this two point correlation function. And now this will be fixed by conformal invariance. So this lets me approximate the dark sector production cross section in a model independent way when we're well above threshold. Now, um, so our current searches at colliders probing these elusive dark sectors. So this is going to be the theoretical param parameter space that I'm going to be showing from now on. And I'll stick to the case in which the dark sector is produced via the Higgs portal. And it also decays via the Higgs portal, which is OHH. Now, the experimental signature that I'm going to be considering is that of a displaced vertex, wherein an, uh, uh, the dark sector particle, when produced, uh, would travel a bit because it has a certain lifetime, and then it would decay inside the detector back to the standard model. So this gives a sort of displaced vertex, this signature that I'm going to be talking about. And here in blue, you see the excluded parameter space by current atlas to displaced vertex searches. Now, this space is also bounded by the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which gives an upper bound on the um, uh, lifetime of the dark sector particle, since we don't want the dark sector particle to decay after the BBN is over. And on the right, we have prompt decays, which are model dependent. So you see, we're left with this space for us, and we um, asked ourselves uh, the obvious question, if we could improve our reach on lower infrared scales, and if fu uh, future proposed experiments for long-lived particles could be useful probes for us. So here's a preliminary plot, and here's my result that you can see. So uh, the white dashed contour shows the uh, Atlas current search, which is the same as the previous plot. And in comparison, you can see the exclusion projections that are coming from future experiments um, that have been proposed at LHC for LLP or long-lived particle searches. So we have Anubis, Mathusla, Alex, and Codex B. So um, the main idea behind these experiments is basically that they comprise a DK volume in the transverse direction from some LHC interaction point. And this allows the long-lived particle 
to decay inside of it to st uh, some standard model charge track. Now, this brings me to the conclusion. So we saw that uh, we saw that we can uh, be model independent while drawing constraints on elusive dark sectors. We saw that current collider bounds leave the parameter space uh, rather unprobed. And we saw that future experiments that have been proposed in the recent past for long lived particle searches will be very useful probes for us. So that brings me to the end of my talk, I think. Yeah. So if you have any uh, model in mind that you'd like us to look at or some future experiment that uh, you've recently proposed, let us know and we'd love to chat. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, um... Any question? So, Jörg, again, yeah, please. Let me actually ask. So, you showed the sensitivity for the long lived particle experiments. Yes. Um, yeah. I find it slightly quite surprising that actually um, the first three experiments are very, very close to each other, but Codex B yeah. is so much weaker. Is there a specific reason in that model? So, so uh, I, I didn't talk. I didn't get to talk about the, the details of the experiment. So, Codex B is very small. So, it's a ten meter across ten meter across ten meter box. So, that really affects it. And for for example, Anubis is huge, and so is Mathusla. So, that's where the problem is coming. I think this this is what I find surprising because Anubis is not so huge, and so Codex Anubis, is very close to the interaction point. So, so Anubis is like fifty six meter long. I think I just it's. It's a cylinder which is really long and it's very close to the interaction point. So it's some I, four meter, but but I can look it up. But uh, yeah. so, so it so might be the that, length. So it might be the, yes, the yes. length that you're in a very good position. Um, true, true, true. I guess central production might be mm -hmm. that production is very central. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot for your question. Okay, thank you. And uh, yes, next question again on Slack. And we. Okay. Move so, so. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Thank you again. And we can move to the next speaker, um, Marciai Kirkla, if I pronounce it correctly. Yes, I see the slides. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, please. Okay, wait, so maybe I'll uh, go to the Okay, so uh, hello everyone and thank you for having me here. Um, today I'm going to talk about gravitational waves, the invisible traces, and their source, a uh, phase transition, which is associated with symmetry breaking in our conformal model. So first, a little about the phase transition. Um, imagine a part of the ocean with all kinds of fishes swimming around, and they have different shapes, and uh, some swim slower, some faster, and one can say that this is due to their interaction with the water. I mean, if they interact more, they move slower, right? And if we now imagine a fish in the air, it would think, oh my God, I'm so free. I don't feel anything. Uh, it would perceive itself as massless because it does not interact with water anymore. So the same story happened in the early universe, but there is no water but a scalar field and no fish but elementary particles. And also the events are now reversed. We start in the massless phase and we transition into the massive one. And of course, such transition could have uh, happened smoothly. However, more interesting case is when we have a barrier between those two phases. In such case, uh, the transition proceeds via so-called bubble nucleation. Uh, the bubbles with new massive phase inside of them start to appear randomly in the whole universe and they start to expand and until they fill all the space, just like boiling the water. And the expansion of those bubbles, the collisions of them, uh, their interactions with surrounding plasma could be a source of gravitational waves, uh, which we'll be able to see in the future. So the model which we are considering is called SU2CSM. Uh, it consists of standard model and an additional SU2 gauge group. Uh, there's also a new scalar introduced, which is a doublet under this new group. And this scalar uh, interacts with standard model only by the Higgs portal. Uh, this C over here stands for the key feature of the model, which is a classical conformal symmetry. Uh, we don't have any dimensional parameters in our Lagrangian. Instead, all the masses are generated via common Weinberg mechanism. So the hierarchy problem is alleviated. Um, moreover, the model is perturbative and stable up to the Planck scale. And uh, the new gauge boson X is stable, and this is our vector dark matter candidate. Uh, like all conformal models, 
models. This one also exhibits a feature called supercooling. And supercooling is a nice feature because it allows the phase transition to happen at low temperatures, uh, significantly below electroweak scale. And this is due to the fact that the barrier, which is thermally produced, lasts till the very t equals zero. And such strong transition uh, produces a strong gravitational wave signal. Uh, so how do one get compute such signal in the first place? Well, if we have a model, then we need to calculate some necessary parameters that describe the phase transition. And those parameters are like uh, the transition scale, uh, the dynamics of the bubbles, the velocity, etc., uh, the energy budget of the phase transition. And if we have those, then we are able to use numerical simulation to calculate the gravitational wave power spectrum. However, it is worth to note that uh, <clears throat> the final result is quite sensitive to theoretical uncertainties. And we already checked that, for example, the RG scale dependence is can change the picture a whole lot. Also, the calculation of thermodynamical parameters, such as the temperature of percolation uh, or nucleation and reheating, uh, the energy transfer in the plasma. Uh, also, this is uh, important to include all the possible sources uh, of the gravitational waves during phase transitions. Uh, however, fortunately, there were many developments in the field, in the field recent, recently, and we are implementing them in our work. So here are our preliminary results. On the y-axis, you can see the gravitational waves abundance. On the x-axis, you can see the frequency of the waves. Both colored regions uh, correspond to uh, future and present, uh, present detectors. And as you can see, for our benchmark points, the LISA detector is the most promising one. So our goal is to provide accurate predictions for LISA using new methods and verify the model and learn about the early universe. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I encourage you to have a look at my poster and contact me in case of any questions. Thank you. So let's see if there is any question. So I don't see any at the moment, but I have one. So you said that uh, this SU2 sector is conformal, so you don't have any scale. So uh, what is more or less setting the scale of the phase transition? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, in our approach, we will be using RG improved potential. So the scale is just the field. OK, so the coupling in practice, uh, it will uh, set more or less the place where you where you have the yeah, I mean, breaking. I mean, the, okay. uh, the scale uh, appears in, in, the, in the picture, let's say, in the first place uh, due to this call my Weinberg mechanism. It's called uh, dimension, dimensional transmutation. Uh, when you include uh, one loop quantum correction to the potential, then you include the scale uh, by including the renormalization scale. Yes, but then it's not clear to me why these symmetries should break at such a, a high scale in some sense. I mean, I would expect, uh, at least in the standard model SU2 sector, the, the transmutation scale would be very low, actually. So below the electroweak scale. Well, it's okay. It depends, of course, on the on the on the value of the parameter you take, and so on the value of the coupling. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, there is no as one single scale that we take, but thanks to this RG improved potential, we can avoid this. Um, I see, Andreas. Is it an urgent question? Otherwise, uh, there is uh, the Slack channel. Uh, I think we are running a bit. Laura, big... Laura, let it. Okay, okay, Andreas, please. Yeah. Just one question: Can can the can the dark can the mass of the vector dark matter candidate be related to the frequency where the, where the where this peaks, so to say, where where the gravitational wave spectrum peak, peaks? Uh, yes, because uh, for example, the VEV of this new scalar. Um, changes the picture of the frequency and also the the coupling of this new scalar a scalar of the, sorry the okay. coupling, the gauge coupling of this new boson so yeah the mass it has some influence okay thanks okay thank you thank and you. Uh, we can just move to the last speaker of the phd forum anupam ray 
Yes, I start to see the screen. Okay. Uh, we don't hear you though. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me. So today I will talk about mergers as a probe of particle dark matter. Somehow, sorry, somehow the screen is not working. Maybe you have to use the arrows uh, to move uh, the slides. No, it is not working. Uh, you, got, you can go out from the full screen and we can probably see it uh, the same. Now, can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. It's not in full screen, but there probably you can change the slide. Uh, see if you can change the slide. Okay, yeah, now I can, yes. Okay, so maybe we can look it at this way. Uh, thanks for having me. So today I will talk about mergers as a probe of particle dark matter. Recent discoveries of low mass black holes pose fundamental question about their origin, whether these black holes are stellar black hole or they are primordial black hole. The situation gets even more interesting with the detection of a subchandrasekhar mass black hole because subchandrasekhar mass black hole cannot be produced by any standard cell revolution. So detection of the subchandrasekhar mass black hole is often thought as a smoking gun signature of its primordial origin. Today, I will show you that detection of the subchandrasekhar mass black hole is not a smoking gun signature of its primordial origin. There exist viable scenarios which can produce subchandrasekhar mass non-primordial black hole. Non-annihilating dark matter with non-zero interaction strength with stellar nuclei is sufficient to produce such black holes. So the main question is, with the detection of a low mass black hole, how do we distinguish what is the origin of this black hole, whether they are stellar or they are primordial. So origin of a low mass black hole can easily be tested by some simple yet powerful probes. Among them, cosmic evolution of the binary merger rates, especially measurement of the binary merger rate at higher redshift can conclusively test the origin. Okay, so now I will briefly review the formation mechanism of transmuted black hole. Dark matter particles from the galactic halo due to their owing to their interaction strength with stellar nuclei, scatter loses energy. So in the energy of the dark matter particle is less than the escape energy of the stellar object, then it forms a bound orbit and considered to be captured. If the dark matter particles are non-annihilating in nature, then with time, dark matter particles accumulate inside the stellar core. Once the number of captured dark matter particle exceeds some threshold value, then the dark core collapses and a micro black hole forms. The micro black hole eventually eats up the star and as a result, transmutation occurs. So depending on the progenitor mass, it can easily be sub it can easily be sub -chandrasekhar. Okay, so one needs to compute what is the capture rate. So capture rate is simply related to the incoming dark matter flux, number of target, scattering cross section and the capture probability. Once we have the capture rate, one can compute the total number of captured particles, which is essentially the age times the capture rate. Now one needs to check this total number of captured particle exceeds the particle required for black hole formation or not. This is the parameter space for transmuted black hole formation. This y-axis is the sigma chi n, dark matter nuclear interaction strength, which is in centimeter square, and x-axis is mass, which is in m chi, which is in GeV. This red shaded region are the parameter space for TBH formation. So in this red shaded region, the inequality satisfies and the black hole formation occurs. All these gray shaded region are exclusion limit from underground delay detection experiment as well as from astrophysics. The left hand side plot is for bosonic dark matter, assuming contact interaction with nuclei, and the right hand side plot is for fermionic dark matter. So now is the vital question. So if we see a low mass black hole, how do we know that it is due to transmuted origin or it has a primordial origin? The answer is simple. We have to look at the redshift dependence of the merger rate. Here is the plot 
merger rate as a function of rate shift. As you can see, the red line, this is the neutron star neutron star merger rate, normalized to the LIGO Vargo measurement. These blue lines, these blue lines is the transmuted black hole merger rate for some representative choice of dark matter parameters. And this purple line, this purple line is the primordial black hole merger rate. Now you can see the primordial black hole merger rate keeps rising with higher red shift because PV8 binaries can merge efficiently in the early universe. On the other hand, this transmuted black hole binary peaks at order one red shift and then falls off because these transmuted black holes are forming due to stellar collapse, dark matter assisted stellar collapse. And the star formation rate is maximum at order one red shift and then it falls off. The mass distribution of the compact object is yet another probe to test the origin of this black hole because uh, the um, transmuted black holes are forming from the stellar collapse and this would follow the mass distribution of the progenitors. This is the mass distribution of the neutron star and this is the mass distribution of the white dwarf. So the transmuted black hole mass distribution will follow this mass distribution and this mass distribution can, can be compared against some well-motivated primordial black hole mass distribution to statistically determine what is the origin of this black hole. So that's all from me. Here are my conclusions. Subchandrasekhar mass black hole is not a smoking gun signature of its primordial origin. non annihilated stellar nuclei is sufficient to produce such black holes. Mass distribution of the progenitors and cosmic evolution of the binary matter rate are some simple probes to test the origin of low mass black hole. With remarkable advances in gravitational astronomy, we have already started to observe unusually low mass black holes. Measurement of these binary merger rates, at, especially at higher rates, by the upcoming gravitational wave experiment like the Desigo and Einstein telescope will settle their origin. So thanks for your attention. And sorry for the initial. Thank you. So question. I don't see. So um, I have a question actually. So in your uh, picture, the the dark matter is still uh, making up the most part of the dark matter uh, in some sense in the universe, and the black holes are just a small fraction. Or you are instead in some sense uh, once the dark matter enters the black hole, uh, then it's mostly in some sense uh, contained into the black holes, and the black holes are the main component of the dark matter. So the, 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 the dark matter is the, the, the cold dark matter is made up of wheels. These wheels are getting captured in white dwarf or neutron star, and and eventually there is a micro black hole formation due to the continuous accumulation of wheels. And this wheel then this wheel then eats up the white dwarf or neutron star, and then a black hole forms. So the cold dark matter is is wheel here. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. I don't see any other questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for the talk. And um, we can then uh, proceed to the next uh, speaker, Guillermo Ballesteros. Hello. Hello. Ah, hi. I see you now. Okay. And I recall, please keep your, uh, your video on so that we know that you are present. Yes, I am. No, I mean, not for you. the moment. For the ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we want to see you yes. as well. But... Okay, okay. Let me let me see if I can share this. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. It's not in uh, um, in uh, full screen, but uh, yeah. Can... And now, yes, wonderful. And did you see my mouse also? Yes, we see your mouse. Very good. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk. I will talk about the primordial black hole dark matter because they asked me to do so and, um, and to do in particular a review of current bounds and also to discuss a little bit uh, possible formation of these objects and the relevance for dark matter. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can change the slide, which I cannot, that's a problem. Now, yes, now. Okay, are you seeing the next slide? Yeah. Hello? Yes, we do. Yes, yes. We do. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so as I said, um, 
the two main questions uh, concerning regarding regarding uh, primordial black holes are uh, which are the the bounds on their abundance and uh, what are the mechanisms by by which they can form and before i start just uh, to say that black holes as as a dark matter is an idea that has gained a lot of uh, interest uh, recently mainly because of ligo but the idea of primordial black holes has been around since the early 70s and even the late 70s, 60s and also the, the the idea of dark matter started about that time but they were not really connected until until recently okay so um, in this in this schematic graph i'm just showing a, a bunch of uh, standard uh, dark matter candidates and as we see here the primordial black holes are are the ones that uh, are at the at the top of the of the mass range, and uh, in spite of uh, what uh, Anupam was telling us, I was uh, highlighting here in particular uh, Chandrasekhar limit, which in let's say in standard uh, physics we consider to be the the limit for astrophysical black holes, and and everything below it uh, we normally think uh, should should have a primordial origin, if any. Okay. And then there is also the evaporation limit, uh, which is uh, important. It tells us that uh, black holes lighter than basically 10 to the minus 20 solar masses or 10 to the minus 19 uh, would have uh, evaporated by, by today because of uh, Hawking radiation and therefore cannot constitute the, the dark matter. So in principle, anything about this mass uh, could be, could be the a good candidate for dark matter uh, and then we enter of course in astrophysical cosmological and other types of, of bounds that i will try to to discuss so focusing a little bit more on 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 this range of the possible uh, masses for primordial black holes um let me just say quickly that uh, um, a black hole that has a mass of around the solar mass um, has a Schwarzschild radius that is of three kilometers right and one that is, uh, let's say, 10 to the minus uh, 12 or 10 to the minus 10 solar masses, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 14 solar masses, uh, has, uh, has the size of, a, of an atom, basically. So there is a huge range of, uh, of masses to consider and also of sizes. And these two rocks that I'm plotting here is because uh, these ones here are typically having the mass of an asteroid, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the size of an asteroid and these ones here have the, the, the size of an asteroid, although their although they're, they're size, the physical size is, is much, much smaller. So the ones, the ones in the top uh, are the ones that uh, LIGO can see up to around 100 solar masses through binary, so the emission of gravitational waves uh, from, from their mergers today. And, uh, and the ones uh, down here are the ones that, uh, that we consider uh, relevant for the dark matter, as we will later see. And this is the so-called asteroid mass window. And until recently, also the ones uh, in the LIGO range were, were we considering as a, as a relevant uh, range for, for dark matter. But as we will see, this is not uh, the case anymore due to several constraints. Okay. Um, and let me just say that these ones here, even though they cannot be observed uh, with interferometers here on, on Earth, uh, it, is, it is perhaps possible to see the, the signal or the signatures of their formation uh, through gravitational waves as well, uh, through space-based interferometers like, like LISA in the future, as we will hopefully discuss later in the talk if I have time. Okay, so this is... Uh, a summary that I have taken uh, from this paper down here by Bradley Cabanag and, and Green about the current bounds on, on primordial black holes. And well, in the vertical axis, what we have is the, is the abundance of black holes uh, as compared to the one of, of dark matter. And of course, for black holes to be all the dark matter, what we want is to be up here in the plot. And uh, as you see, this is the this window here that goes between 10 to the minus 17 to 10 to the minus 11 solar masses is this asteroid mass window that, that we think today is the relevant one for, for dark matter. And the, the ones that LIGO can, can observe are on the other side of the plot around one solar mass or 
ten hundred solar masses. Okay, and these bounds here are aggregated bounds, meaning that uh, they are they show uh, together different uh, constraints from different experiments, but uh, putting together different constraints of the same kind, starting from evaporation, then moving to microlensing, and then this uh, gravitational waves bound, accretion, and dynamical. And I will now discuss briefly uh, all of them. But of course, I cannot uh, discuss every single constraint in detail because there is no, no time. So I will just focus on the ones that I think are more important. Yeah, before, before doing that, let me also tell you that all the bounds that I will, I will consider assume that the, that the black holes uh, are all of the same mass. So basically, their distribution is just a uh, Dirac delta. Okay. But there are also uh, uh, studies which uh, consider that the mass distribution of the black holes can be extended, even um, extending to several decades in mass. And, and distribution that is often used is this log normal distribution here. And as you see, the, the bounds uh, can change quite significantly. In fact, they typically become uh, more difficult to evade for broad mass distributions. And there are uh, algorithms and ways to to pass from these uh, single mass uh, constraints to the to the extended mass functions constraints. Although this uh, has to be done with a little bit of care because of course all, all constraints cannot be translated in, in the same way because of the different physics that are, that are involved in each of them. Okay, so let me, let me start with the evaporation. So as you know, uh, black holes emit radiation uh, essentially as uh, black bodies, as distorted black, black bodies, with a temperature that is given only by, by their mass. And uh, in particular, by looking at the diffuse uh, background of uh, gamma rays and X-rays, um, we, can, we can put uh, strong bounds on, on the abundance of light primordial black holes. So in this plot here, what I'm showing is the, the spectrum of the universe, if you want, in gamma rays and nick rays from a variety of uh, satellites and observations. And these bumps that you can see on the right are the contribution that uh, black holes of uh, the masses that are indicated there with abundances of here equal to all the dark matter and down here uh, just 10 to the minus three times uh, the total dark matter abundance would produce. So, so here the game would be to, to try to pinpoint uh, in all this data, which uh, astrophysicists think that can be explained by, by the emission from AGNs and, and blazers, to try to see this kind of uh, signals or bumps uh, in a similar way to what you would do in a, in a collider if you want. Okay? And uh, from this kind of analysis, uh, one can constrain the, the abundance of light PBH uh, uh, to, to this level, to, to the level that uh, black holes that are uh, lighter than 10 to the minus 17 solar masses or so cannot be all the dark matter. This is what you see in this plot directly from, from these uh, gamma rays and nick rays observations that will be a line that goes down here. This ERGRP, but of course there are many other constraints that are all related to to evaporation because uh, when these black holes evaporate, they do not only emit uh, photons, but they also emit uh, other particles depending on their mass, and they and these particles can also be observed by by a variety of, of processes, which also which also put uh, similar constraints. The difference between the the pure um, gamma ray background constraint from evaporation and all the other ones is that the ones that, uh, that do not look at the diffuse background uh, are, are uh, subject to astrophysical uncertainties because they, they typically use uh, the emission from the, from the center of the galaxy or neighboring regions, which, which, we, have to, which we have to model, okay? But anyway, all these, all these bounds are, are quite strong and robust and, and they tell us that uh, black holes that are lighter than 10 to the minus 17 solar masses cannot be the dark matter. Okay. The next interesting constraints are the ones that come from microlensing, which is uh, the enhancement uh, in the luminosity of, uh, of a star that, that occurs when uh, another uh, body, let's say in a star or uh, for us a black hole, a primordial black hole, uh, crosses the line of sight between the, 
the starting meeting the light and ourselves here or or the satellite looking at the at the signal and these these events uh, can be seen in the variability that takes uh, place during days or, or even months and here in, in the screen you see such an effect from Ogel which has also been observed by, by Gaia and by comparing the, the rate of uh, expected events uh, of this kind if the dark matter was made of black holes of a certain mass to the actual number of events that we that we observe we can put uh, strong strong bounds on, on the abundance of primordial black holes and these bounds are the ones that I saw in this list, next slide. So, for example, here on the left, we have a bounce from the Subaru telescope. Then there is Eros and Ogel, all of which uh, use uh, very similar techniques. Then there is Kepler here on the top. Uh, and this M is the match experiment, which is older. And here is Icarus. And this bounce here on the top of, of the screen on the right corner come from uh, lensing of uh, supernovas, not uh, standard stars, and were obtained. Uh, in 2017 by Miguel Zumalacarregui and Uro Seljak. So all of these uh, are, are putting again very strong bounds on the abundance of dark matter between 10 to the minus 12 and 10 to the three uh, solar masses, okay? And these bounds, these microlensing ones and the and the evaporation bounds that I, were, I was showing you before are the ones that uh, constrain this asteroid mass window that we think is relevant for, for the dark matter. Okay, so moving on, the next bounds uh, that are that are uh, very significant are the ones that come from from gravitational waves. There are um, two main bounds, and I will discuss only one of them, which is this, uh, the one of mergers that you can see here that, that puts very strong constraints uh, on the abundance of primordial black holes between 0 0.1 or 1 to 100 solar masses. And these bounds come essentially from comparing the, the rate of, of mergers observed by, by LIGO, uh, which is about uh, 100 events per gigaparsec cube per year, roughly, uh, to what you would expect if uh, the dark matter, of course, was made of primordial black holes. So interestingly enough, this, uh, this kind of physics was the one that in 2016, created all the, this renewed interest in the possibility that black holes could be could be the dark matter. This was because in 2016, LIGO announced uh, the first detection of, uh, of uh, gravitational waves, right? The direct detection of gravitational waves uh, with two black holes of 30 solar masses each. And then there were people that uh, quickly proposed the, the idea that perhaps uh, these black holes could be uh, part of the dark matter, or actually the dark matter. No? And uh, well, the problem was that uh, the, the estimates of the merger rate that, that were done uh, from, from this uh, single event were compared, were compared to, to an estimate of, of the expected uh, theoretical uh, merger rate, assuming that uh, these binaries of black holes were were producing halos, okay? And in reality, we know uh, that uh, there's another mechanism to produce these binaries, which happens at uh, much earlier times uh, in the very early universe before, before matter radiation equality, which is the one that is uh, illustrated here at the bottom, in which two uh, black holes uh, that could essentially collide heads on to each other, uh, get uh, perturbed by a, by a third black hole that is passing by, producing a, a torque between the two, which then leads to a binary uh, that we will observe uh, merging today, okay? And this uh, early uh, formation of the binaries gives a, gives a rate of, uh, of merging that is much, much uh, larger than the one that was used to, to propose this idea. So, so that's why LIGO today puts a strong bound on, on the abundance of this dark matter. Yeah. Still, uh, as I said, this, uh, this created a, a lot of interest. Uh, LIGO created a lot of interest in the possibility that black holes could be the dark matter. And as you can see here in, in this slide, I, I would say that uh, primordial black holes are, are perhaps the candidate that is uh, 
growing faster in, in interest in the in the latest uh, year as compared to to other possibilities that are more stable or even uh, decaying a bit. Okay, so um, let me quickly move on to discuss uh, the bounds on accretion and dynamical bounds, which again I'm taking from this review by Anne Green and Bradley Kavanagh. And uh, here concerning accretion, I will I will only discuss CMB bounds and and and, discuss, and concerning the the dynamical bounds. Let me just say that if you have uh, sufficiently heavy black holes, they can perturb the, the dynamics of uh, binary stars. And, and by not observing this this sort of perturbations in stars or even galaxies, uh, we can we can again put bounds. So. Going back to the to the CMB bounds, uh, what happens is that uh, when when these black holes uh, form, uh, since they they have to be as we said primordial in order to be to explain the dark matter, they have to be around at the time of the CMB, and in particular between recombination and reionization, and the accretion of uh, surrounding gas that uh, that these black holes uh, would suffer. Uh, heats the environment around us, and, and this uh, heating changes the, the CMB properties. It can change the temperature and also the polarization of the CMB. And depending a little bit on what is the mechanism of accretion, depending on whether the accretion is a radial infall of the particles or whether there is a disk around these primordial black holes, we get uh, slightly different bounds. But uh, these bounds are strong and tell us that uh, black holes of around the solar or 10 solar masses cannot, again, be the dark matter or they can only be a small fraction of it, okay? And the last analysis is done in, in this paper by Pasquale Serpico and collaborators. All right, so uh, this is a summary again of the of the bounds that I wanted to, to, to show you and should be mainly the main message of, of this talk. If you want to look for uh, dark matter in the form of primordial black holes, look to this uh, asteroid window. But I also want to tell that uh, uh, in reality, uh, this field is still uh, changing quickly. So in, perhaps in the next uh, few years, there will be surprises. And to illustrate that, let me show you what was the situation uh, basically before 2019, where this window that uh, we consider today to be the, to be the most relevant uh, was still supposed to be constrained by, by a variety of observations like uh, femtolensing of uh, gamma ray bars, and also by encounters of these primordial black holes uh, with uh, white dwarfs or neutron stars. Now we know that uh, all these bounds are unreliable for, uh, for different reasons. These ones because of the complicated treatment of the optics involved, and these ones because of the physics uh, on the, of these encounters. But uh, the point is that uh, there should be a lot of activity in trying to, to constrain this window and even perhaps uh, reconsider these, these ideas here or, or new ones. Okay? And if you want to see a detailed explanation of why these uh, constraints went away, uh, please look at the papers that are cited at the bottom. Okay, so I think I have uh, about uh, maybe seven minutes to discuss a little bit of primordial black hole formation, which of course is very important if we really want to consider this idea seriously. There are, there are many mechanisms to produce them. I will only focus in, in one of them, which perhaps is the most popular today, that is uh, inflation, okay? Uh, and what's the motivation for this? Well, the motivation is that uh, as, as you know, I mean, we don't really know if inflation happened or not at all, but uh, we know it's a good uh, explanation to, to, to describe the, the CMB anisotropies, the temperature anisotropies of the CMB, as well as the large scale structure of the, of the universe. And, and the question is whether uh, perhaps inflation can also uh, tell us something about the, the structure of the universe at much, much smaller scales, the one needed for, for dark matter, okay? So in particular, uh, if the fluctuations that are produced uh, during inflation, the quantum fluctuations, the famous primordial fluctuations were large enough, uh, perhaps they could have produced uh, black holes. Okay, this is the idea. So how this comes to happen? Well, uh, simply if you have uh, at some scale, distance scale or energy scale, if you prefer, uh, a very large fluctuation, there will be patches of the universe that will be much denser than uh, 
patches of the universe surrounding them. And when these fluctuations become in causal contact after inflation during radiation domination, those, those patches will collapse, producing a, a black hole like in this sketch. Okay, so this is the usual diagram in which we plot uh, on the horizontal axis the logarithm of the scale factor of the universe, which you can essentially take as a measurement of time, and in, in the vertical scale, co-moving scale, that is uh, distance, okay? And the idea is that these fluctuations that are generated uh, during inflation, as I said, when they re-enter the, the horizon during radiation, if they are large enough, they will, they will correspond to regions of the universe that are so dense that nothing can oppose their, their collapse into a, a black hole, okay? So now, what will be the mass of the black holes produced in this way? Well, the mass is basically uh, determined by the density of the universe at the time at which the collapse is started, this rho, times the, the size of the, of the sphere in which this mass is, is contained, which is given by the Hubble radius. And then by using just Friedman equations, you can see immediately at which scales you need to have these uh, large fluctuations from inflation. And these scales, this uh, k here, is much, much uh, smaller in distance. So the k is much larger than the ones of the CMB scales. I think I have five minutes, right? Okay, now the difficulty with all this is that uh, in order to really uh, uh, produce something that collapses, you need to have fluctuations that are very large. And this means that uh, you have to, to, to search for them in the tails of your probability distribution, okay? Because there is a threshold for the collapse, which is indicated here at the bottom. And this threshold is order one, let's say, to simplify. Now, this means that if you want to compute the abundance of the primordial black holes, you just have to essentially compute the integral of all the possible uh, fluctuations that are above this value of the threshold and assuming the distribution that these uh, fluctuations follow is Gaussian, which is what we know, for example, from the CMB, then the abundance will be given by expression like this one here, where this quantity sigma, uh, the dispersion, is nothing but uh, the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. So this is the, this is the beauty of the idea, but it's also the the curse of it, because it's not so easy to, to produce a primordial power spectrum in inflation that is as large as this one. And let me remind you that the typical size of the primordial power spectrum that we measure from the CMB is about seven orders of magnitude smaller, okay? So already in, in, in the 90s, there were people thinking about this. Uh, they were a little bit ahead of our time, let's say. And they identified the, the mechanism that is uh, most popular even today uh, for generating large fluctuations during inflation. And this is as simple as having a potential as shown here that is sufficiently flat, okay? This is like a, a simplified uh, version, but it's enough to, to get the idea. And the reason is that the primordial power spectrum is uh, given by the inverse square of the velocity of the of the inflaton field as it rolls out the potential, or if you want, uh, by the by the slope, the inverse of the slope of the potential. Okay, and this picture on the right is just a, a modern realization of of this idea from the picture is taken from a paper of of myself. Okay, so this is the sort of power spectrum that you get here at on the left at the CMB scales. The, the power spectrum is perfectly flat or almost flat as, as required to feed the CMB. And then at some smaller scale, you get this huge peak, which seems uh, frankly uh, so unnatural. That will be the one that uh, is generating uh, this, uh, this abundance of, of primordial black holes as shown on the right, okay? Now, there is something very interesting about this, and this is the fact that uh, having so large fluctuations uh, on the scalar power spectrum means that there are induced uh, tensor fluctuations uh, as well that are very large, that is uh, gravitational waves. And, and this sort of mechanism uh, produces a stochastic background of gravitational waves, which is what I was referring to at the beginning of my talk, that can, that can uh, be observed in principle by, by LISA and, uh, and other experiments in the future. This is just because the frequency of the, of the gravitational waves that are produced in this way happens to be precisely in the, in the right, in the right uh, range. Okay. 
So let me just uh, conclude uh, with uh, this slide, which uh, is just to, to motivate uh, a little bit more this idea that inflation can produce primordial black holes. So what I showed you before was a very specific example of, uh, of an inflaton rolling down some potential. But instead of considering that, what we can do is uh, to look at the, at the equation that is governing the dynamics of the fluctuations themselves. And uh, this, this equation here is just the action for these fluctuations during, during inflation, where these coefficients are in reality uh, functions of time. And just by studying uh, all the, sorry, this is the alarm for the, <laughs> excuse me. And, and just by studying the, the dynamics of, of, the, the, of this, uh, of this uh, action and the solution basically of these equations of motion is all you need to, to compute the, the primordial power spectrum for any single field model of inflation that you want. And therefore the, the, the dynamics of, uh, of these different quantities uh, can be used to, to generate uh, peaks in the power spectrum in many different ways that I don't have time to to discuss. So by studying in detail, if you want the structure of the primordial power spectrum, we, we may get a, a hint uh, of, of the dynamics that, uh, or the sort of uh, physics that was involved in inflation. Okay. Okay. So let me just uh, conclude. So the main, main message of the talk is that uh, if, if you want to, to look for primordial black holes as, as dark matter, please uh, do it in, in this mass uh, window that is shown here. And then there are, I think, three interesting um, directions to, to follow. So one of them is uh, how to really test or close this window, which is uh, not easy at all. Uh, the second one will be to, to consider uh, more ideas for the phenomenology of primordial black hole formation. I only talk about inflation, but there are other possibilities like uh, cosmic strings or phase transitions. And finally, uh, another interesting idea that, uh, that I couldn't discuss is uh, what are the implications for, for other beyond the standard model problems if, if black holes are really the dark matter. For example, there are indications that uh, primordial black holes and certain uh, WIMP models do not like each other very, very much. So if, if there is a large fraction of the dark matter in primordial black holes, they, they would exclude the uh, the rest from being uh, WIMPs. Okay, so these kind of ideas can also be very interesting for the future, I think. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I see already a couple of hands up. So I think we can already. So Alvaro, I think, was the first. Please go on, ask your question. Yes, as you said yourself, uh, limits are time dependent and they sometimes evaporate. <laughs> So the, the most serious limits, uh, the most sad limits that you have discussed are the ones around solar mass black holes, a few orders of magnitude up and down from that. And those are excluded by microlensing. Aren't the, these exclusions extremely dependent on the assumed distribution of the uh, black holes, whether they are collected in a corner of the galaxy or have the same distribution as the halo, thousand possibilities. Yeah, uh, so maybe maybe I should try to go back to my slides um, to discuss a little bit more precisely what you're saying. So let's see, am I, am I still sharing? Uh, yes. Yes. yes, yeah. I am sorry, but I cannot uh, see my own screen. That's the problem. Okay, here it is. All right. So, um, yeah. So you said uh, one solar mass, uh, Alvaro? Well, uh, one that... hour of magnitude around a solar mass, say right. from 21 uh, grams to 10 to the 36 grams. Yeah, okay. So this is around here, okay? Uh, so first of all, as you see, it is not just a microlensing, right? There are there are other bounds. Uh, there is uh, there is the accretion, so the CMB bounds. There are also gravitational waves, and if you go even to the right, there are these dynamical bounds that I also mentioned. So this this possibility that you are discussing is is what uh, people uh, refer to in the literature as the possible clustering of primordial black holes. As you said, the fact that uh, the 
the bounds can depend on whether they are distributed, uh, let's say, more or less randomly in space or not. Okay. Now, the problem is that even though there are arguments um, and papers that maybe can explain one of these constraints out by assuming some specific distribution for the black holes, it's very difficult to get rid of all of them simultaneously. Okay. So it is true that, uh, it is true that for example, the microlensing can be uh, relax or even partially, yeah, even evaded, I would say, if you put the black holes uh, adequately in, in, in the galaxy that you're looking at, but then you probably cannot get rid of uh, the CMB bounds, right? So that's the difficulty. There are, there are arguments though uh, by people uh, even that you know well that, uh, that try to to go say that, yeah, to go around, yeah, but but I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say these uh, these arguments are compelling enough at the moment to to take this window uh, very seriously. So what I, what I'm showing here is is not just uh, my my personal opinion, but I think it's the it's the status of the of the field at the moment. Okay, although this doesn't mean that this could change, as you said, but uh, it will it will require a little bit more effort than uh, let's say three or four years ago, okay? Well, also the limits are at the level of a, a tenth of the maximum, and that would be good for everybody. If the dark matter is one tenth in primordial uh, black holes and nine tenths in something else, everybody would be happy. Totally, totally, yeah. That, that, would, be, that would be very interesting. In fact, here you could have, uh, as you said, 10% uh, of the dark matter in, in black holes. Uh, easily according to these bounds, yes. Thanks very much. Thanks to you. Hey, thanks. And we can go to the next, uh, um, next question, Andreas. Hi, Guillermo, thank you for the nice talk. Hi. So one, one question, so, so you mentioned the different mechanisms to produce these primordial, uh, this primordial black holes. And it appears to me that in all these uh, mechanisms, in the inflationary or cosmic strings or phase transitions, you would expect a gravitational wave signature. And uh, so, so can these can these different mechanisms then be dis, uh, discriminated by the spectrum of the gravitational waves they produce? And on, is the peak always in the in the LISA range, or did you did you uh, artificially put it there? <laughs> No. So what, what did you... <laughs> what did I cook here, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, uh, th yeah, let me, let me first uh, start with this plot, maybe, which is yeah. what you're referring to. So if it's inflation, okay, and they are produced from a large peak in the power spectrum, yeah. and if they are in this asteroid mass window, then, it then be there. Ah, okay. there is no cooking yeah. because it's just this yeah. formula yeah. here on the top. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. The mass gives you the frequency, one to one correspondence, mm -hmm. right? And the amplitude is determined by the fraction, or, or can be the related amplitude to is, the fraction is, of target matter. It's given by the fraction, yeah. And here in the plot, it is assuming so this will be the sort of signal you would see, and yeah. this is assuming that they are all of the dark matter. Yes. Now, of course, okay. this scales mm -hmm. down if they are not mm -hmm. uh, all of it. And for example, this line that you see here, it's the, the expected uh, noise or background, if you want, mm -hmm. from astrophysical uh, neutron star and black holes that will be mm -hmm. uh, also uh, seen oh, in this, in this yeah. range. So in principle, to see them, you have to subtract this, right? It's not just the sensitivity of uh, LISA mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. But then, as you said, there are other possibilities to produce uh, gravitational waves in this range, as you know, because LISA mm -hmm. or, or LISA, whatever you call it, uh, I mean, it has many motivations, phase transition at the yeah. weak scale or above. So this could be a problem. Now, the other question that you said, whether the other mechanisms that are not inflation to produce uh, yes. black holes could be disentangled from yes. this. I don't know. Uh, it might mm -hmm. because the shape is not going to be the same of the spectrum. But mm -hmm. then this assumes mm -hmm. that you are able to measure this spectrum uh, faithfully, let's say, which okay. I don't know if it will be possible at all or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that the, the analysis of gravitational wave production in some other of these mechanisms is not uh, as developed as in the case of inflation. So I think it's too early to really say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
Uh, okay, so we have a last question, and I would say, uh, yeah, Pablo, go on, <laughs> possibly short, but uh, yeah, go on. Thanks, Guillermo, for the nice talk. So could you comment a bit more on why there's this incompatibility between having a, a wind and, and, the, and the primordial black holes? Why, why, what's the reason? Yeah, so I, I, I'm not an expert on that, but I think the idea is very simple. So it's just that... Um, if uh, black holes are the, the dark matter, there will be regions, uh, well, not the dark matter, a fraction of it, let's say, a substantial fraction of it. Uh, there will be regions in, in the universe or in the galaxy where you would expect to find uh, more dark matter of any other kind, right? Let's say WIMPs. And, uh, you know, if uh, these WIMPs can uh, annihilate, then they will uh, do so more likely around primordial black holes than than that they don't that they would they that they, than what they than what they do if if uh, if they will not be these uh, primordial black holes uh, so abundantly around so that's that's the only thing I mean you would expect to see from indirect detection bounds on dark matter uh, some sort of signal that that we don't see but of course this is very model dependent right I mean, because there are there are there are models for which this sort of signal is uh, is much lower than for others. So that's that's the only reason. Yeah. I'm not aware of an incompatibility of this sort uh, between um, primary black holes and axions, for example. So that's uh, that's what I can tell you. But uh, again, it's uh, it's model dependent. Yeah. For example, I know that asymmetric dark matter, I think, could be something you could use to, to evade this sort of thing. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any question more. So I think we can thank uh, Guillermo again uh, for the very good talk and the discussion. Thank you. And uh, at this point, I think uh, we can uh, close the session since we are already over time. So thanks uh, to all for the participation and for the talks, of course, but also for the participation. And I guess we will resume tomorrow uh, again at three o'clock. At three o'clock, uh, yes, summertime, Central European with post fellow. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for the sharing again. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, no problem. <laughs> So have a nice day if you are in America or a nice evening in Europe or night if you are in Asia. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.